The next thing I'd like to do is, is uh, sort of a disclaimer and just to let everybody know that uh, my presentation is not a balanced presentation. So if you came here hoping or thinking that you're going to um, hear a balanced presentation on the Israeli-Palestinian issue, you're going to be uh, sorely disappointed. My perspective is clearly one-sided. It is clearly not balanced. Um, quite frankly, I don't believe that there is a balanced presentation out there because if anybody cares enough to stand up and speak about it, they probably come from a very strong point of view one way or another. Um, and it's not a balanced situation. So you can't talk about balance here at all because it doesn't exist. And for me, like you heard, this is a deeply personal issue as well. So, uh, and, and for many people it is as well, you know, and for many people this is a very personal and it touches nerves and, you know. Um, so like I said, this is not a balanced presentation and I'd like to put that out there, particularly if people here have um, uh, strong feelings, uh, you know, strong positive feelings towards Israel. My presentation is very difficult to hear. Um, because my criticism of Israel is very, very strong. So once again, I like to put that out there uh, so that you know this in advance. Um, well, I'm glad I give you hope. And I'll tell you, I, th I think hope, I think, you know, without hope, really, this, the, this whole conversation is, is pointless. Because if there's no hope, why do we even bother? And I gave a talk about six months ago in front of an eighth grade class in San Diego. And in preparation for my talk, they, you know, studied the subject and so on. And one of the things they did was they decided to take a poll among themselves to see how many of them believed that they would see peace in their lifetime. Now, eighth graders are 13 years old, okay? And they showed me the results of this poll before I began speaking. And they, the results of the poll were that 80% of them, 80% of them thought they would not see peace in their lifetime. We're talking about Israel, Palestine. So these 13 years old, based on the information that they had, came to the conclusions that they would never see peace in their lifetime. So when I came to speak to them, when I began my remarks, I told them, you know, I'm a lot older than they are, I'm 51. And there's no doubt in my mind, there is no doubt in my mind at all that there will be peace in my lifetime. And that it's um, achievable, it's doable, it's realistic. Um, and if I didn't have that kind of hope, I wouldn't be up here uh, talking to you. Because what's the point? If there's no hope, why are we, you know, why knock your head against the wall? Um, how many people here think they'll, that, that it's possible that they will see peace in their lifetime in Israel-Palestine? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, how many people think they won't see peace in their lifetime? Okay, it's not bad. Anybody here just not sure? Anybody on the fence? Might go either way? All uh, right, you can't, you can't vote twice. <laughs> um, now, this issue gets confusing, particularly if you're not, you know, following it day by day, because there's so much myth that has been piled onto this. And um, normally, if you have an argument with someone, then you agree on the basic facts, and perhaps you disagree on how to move forward. Perhaps you disagree on the analysis. On this issue, the disagreement is about the actual facts. It's about the actual history. And then at some point, if, you're not, if you haven't been following this thing your whole life, at one point you kind of have to study yourself, put a lot of time into it, or just pick a side, which is what most people do. And in this country particularly, people tend to pick the wrong side. This country um, and the West in general always comes down, and I think for, for perhaps for, for reasons that they believe are good and true, always comes down supporting Israel. And I think that's the wrong choice. And I'll, and I'll, and, uh, and, and I'll make it clear why uh, in just a little bit. Um, so it's like I said, but it's not, it's not surprising that there's so much confusion and so many people are not really quite clear as to, as to um, how this is going to, you know, how to approach this issue, but also that there's, there's so little hope. Um, now, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example of, um, of some of the myth that exists and some of the double standards that exist that makes it, make it so difficult. The whole idea of Zionism, which is the ideology that brought about the state of Israel, was based on the notion that Jewish people have a right to go back to their historical homeland. 
Now, this is based on a theory that says that the Jewish people today are the descendants of the ancient Hebrews that resided in that part of the world some two, three thousand years ago. And let's assume for a moment that this theory is true. So Zionism claimed, about a hundred and so years ago, that the Jewish people, because they are the descendants of the ancient Hebrews, have a right, and the word they use is return, to return to their ancient homeland. So there's no Jewish person alive that can trace their roots back to the you know, land of, ancient land of Israel or to the ancient Hebrews. Yet they use the term return as though we were all just there and now we're just returning. It was just a small two, three thousand year pause and now we're all going back. And what's amazing is that the Zionist leaders of the time, this was my grandfather's generation, were able to sell this. They were able to sell this to the powers that be that this right exists, that they, have, they can claim this right. And I think a lot of the fact that they were successful had to do with the fact that they were white and they were well dressed and they were, and they were all doctors and they knew how to drink tea and they looked civilized as opposed to the natives who were kind of brown and not quite fit in, if not exactly fit in with the, you know, the, uh, the colonial uh, powers. Um, but there we are. And today it's perfectly acceptable to say, well, Jews have a right to live in Israel and there's birthright, an organization called Birthright, which takes young American kids there to show them they have this right and so on and so forth. Now let's put, let's, let's place right next to this theory another claim for the right of return, and this is the, right, the claim that Palestinians make to return to their homeland. Now Palestinians left Palestine, or were forced to leave Palestine, some 65 years ago, over, over, or I should say over the last 65 years. Palestinians who were exiled 65 years ago, many of them are still alive. In other words, when they say return, they mean them personally to return. Even if they passed away, they gave their descendants, their children and their grandchildren, the deeds to their home and the keys, quite often the keys to their home, and very often those homes are still there. In areas where the homes have been destroyed, you will see old Palestinians, older Palestinians, walk through rubble, walk through fields, and find their home and find the well, and find the church or the mosque. But when the right of return of Palestinian com to Palestinians comes up for discussion, those who represent the Israeli point of view always say, no, that is out of the question. This was a long time ago, and Palestinians have to forget. So a people who make their claim based on something that may or may not have happened two, 3,000 years ago, are telling a people who can still remember their home and were exiled 65 years ago that they have to forget. This is a kind of double standard that's been accepted in the discourse about the issue of Palestine. And this is one of the reasons why it's so confusing. Because rationally you see that it's absurd. But when everybody says it's, 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 it's not absurd, everybody treats it like it's normal, then you think, well, maybe it is normal. Maybe there's something wrong with the way I'm thinking. And there's lots, there are many, many examples uh, like this one that demonstrate, and again, this is why it's so complicated. You have to sift through all of this, and you have to kind of make sense of it all. Now, the issue of Palestine, we talked about this earlier over lunch, there's so much bad news. So much bad news. It's so hard. It's so depressing. I chose to begin my remarks today with something that I found very... Uh, hopeful and, 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 um, and remarkable. Has anybody here seen the movie Five Broken Cameras? Not enough. Not enough people. You should all, it's on, it's on, it's on uh, Netflix, it's easy to find. It's a remarkable documentary. It's a remarkable documentary that documents the Palestinian struggle against occupation and the brutal violence that they face. Whether you agree with the Palestinian issue or don't agree with the Palestinian issue, it's a movie that has to be seen. Anyway, as you may have heard, it was nominated for an Oscar. And this is Ahmad Burnat, uh, Ahmad Burnat who, is the, who, who made the movie. Uh, and he's the cameraman. The five broken cameras are his cameras as he you know, goes, goes through from protest to protest. 
Um, and he's from the village of Berlin, a town of Berlin, which is where this, this um, movement called the Popular Resistance began in 2005. And I thought this was a glorious moment. This was, this was good news. It, was, it gave a sense of pride. I think it was a salute to the man, to his work, to the, the, the village, Berlin, where he comes from, and to the entire resistance, the Palestinian resistance, which is usually portrayed as negative, as violent, as dark, as ugly. And here we are, finally, they have an opportunity to be recognized for the, um, their honesty, for their dedication, and for their right to resist. So anyway, I just thought I'd, you know, I'd, 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 I'd kick this off, start this off with, um, on a positive note. But that's not to say that there aren't a lot of reasons to be, um, uh, to be saddened and, and, and depressed about this issue, because there is so much sadness. One of the, one of the coming from, a, from my background as an Israeli and from a very patriotic family, one of the things that I found hard to accept is that the Palestinians call the Israeli independence the Nakba, which means a catastrophe. So the war of 1948, which was the war that, after which Israel was created, which we, the Israelis, call the War of Independence, and we think it is one of the most important, uh, one of the most important events in the Jewish history the revival of the Jewish people, the creation of the Jewish state after all, you know, all these thousands of years, they would call it a catastrophe, that somebody would call it a catastrophe. It personally insulted me. I was personally hurt when I, when I heard this at first. And over the years, as I met Palestinians and I became familiar with the uh, Palestinian issue, I understood why, but why, they, why it's considered a, a catastrophe. But what's important to understand on this, in this, in this um, is that the Palestinian catastrophe began in 1948, but it goes on to this very day. These children on the screen are from a refugee camp called the Gaza Refugee Camp. It's in northern Jordan. I've traveled the world. I've been to a lot of places. I've been to a lot of refugee camps. Such poverty I've never seen. People that were so destitute I have never seen. Sewage, that, you see that sewage running through the street, there's no running water, forget heating. 14, 15, 13 people in a small room, which is what they call these houses, living in such poverty that they can't afford the matches to light the sticks to make a small fire for tea. Now, this is not in some remote sub-Saharan or, or Central Asian, uh, you know, spot. This is an hour's drive from Haifa, Tel Aviv, and Jerusalem. Children, they, they have no access to medical care. So children with mental illness have to be tied and chained in a room. And this is, once again, maybe an hour's drive from some of the best hospitals, period. And this is happening on our watch, every single day, today. This is a catastrophe. Not only that it happened 48 years ago, or 1948, 65 years ago, but it's happening today, and it's being allowed to continue today. This is Gaza itself. I recently visited Gaza, just like, uh, in January. And this is what it looks like. This is the result of an Israeli air attack, air raid. And the catastrophe is that a child going to school, kids going to school every day in Gaza have to go past this, and many like this. And they don't know if their home will look like this when they come home, if their best friends or their relatives won't be killed as a result of an air raid like this in the next day, in the next hour, if they come home and they'll have a family. In this particular house, 13 people were killed, I believe. The father and one of the kids, the father went to work and his son chased him, asking him not to forget to bring something after work when the air raid took place. So the father and one young son survived. This is a catastrophe, that this is being allowed to happen today under our watch, 65 years after the initial catastrophe 
which was the cause of the State of Israel, which allowed the State of Israel to be established. This is why it's a catastrophe. And this is the tunnel that I had to use to go into Gaza. Gaza is under siege. And the only reason there's only malnutrition in Gaza, but not total starvation, is because the people of Gaza are resourceful enough, and they built almost 1,500 tunnels on a, on a border, a stretch, a stretch of land that is less than 10 miles wide. And this is how oil and food and money and people and everything goes in and out of Gaza. Israel, you know, Israel blocked Gaza almost completely, and the Egyptians are very unpredictable. So I had to go. This is the tunnel I used to get in. And nearly 2 million people who live in Gaza rely on this for their supplies, for, com for commerce, for, for anything you need to, to, to continue living. This is a catastrophe. It's unforgivable. It's inexplicable. It's unjustifiable. And this is, again, an hour's drive from uh, Jerusalem. I could have driven an hour and 15 minutes from Jerusalem and, re and reached Gaza. It took me 14 hours. Because I had to go through Egypt, through Sinai, and then go in through a tunnel. This is a catastrophe. It's happening under our watch. And we're allowing it to happen. So going back to the fact that Palestinians call 1948 the catastrophe, it was the beginning of a catastrophe. It wasn't just the catastrophe. Now, one of the claims that's made about this issue, one, one of, another one of the ridiculous claims that's being made um, and, is, and, and is used to explain why it's unsolvable, is that this issue has been going on for so many years, for so many generations, those people over there have been killing each other. And you know the term, those people over there. That there's really no hope. And I would argue that a good time, historically, to start speaking about this issue is precisely November of 1947. On November the 29th, 1947, the United Nations decided they will solve the Jewish-Palestinian or the Israeli-Palestinian issue, there was no Israel yet, through a partition of Palestine. And this is what they came up with. Look at the map. Imagine if you knew nothing about this at all. You took a look at this map, and somebody told you, now go on the ground and mark the boundaries. How do you even do that? It's such an absurd proposition. But besides that, besides the way that it looks, what the United Nations did was they decided they were going to give the larger portion of the land to a small group of Jewish immigrants who, had, who were living there, less than half a million people, the generation of my grandparents and my parents, and give the smaller portion of the country to the native population Palestinians who were close to a million and a half people. And to this day, people come up and claim that the Palestinians, this is all the Palestinians' fault, by the way, this whole conflict, because in 1947, they refused to accept this. Israel, of course, accepted this. Why wouldn't they? A small community of immigrants that numbered less than half a million people. That was all, that, that was, that was the, 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 you know, the, the total number of people, of Jewish people living there at the time. Why wouldn't they accept giving, getting the larger portion of the country? And the Palestinians, like I said, who are the natives of the land, who numbered close to a million and a half people, were supposed to accept the smaller portion. This was their country. They have been there for generations. And to this day, people say it's all their fault because they didn't accept this. Would anybody accept this? Does anybody know anybody who would accept something like this? Such an absurd proposition? And this is the point where the two stories, like I said earlier, the actual history Diverged because at, from this point on, the Israelis tell one story of the events, and the Palestinians and pretty much everybody else tell a different story. Now, as an Israeli, what I learned, and what I'm sure, uh, what I know Americans learned, because my kids go to school here, is that as soon as this resolution was accepted by the United Nations, it was rejected by the Arabs, because we don't see Palestinians. In other words, in those days, and even to this day, Israelis and Zionists prefer to say Arabs or the Arabs of Israel. They rejected this proposal, and they went on a massive attack. They began a massive attack to destroy the small Jewish community, just like the Nazis did before them 
and just like the Romans and the Greeks did 2,000 years ago, and so on and so forth. And just like the Inquisition, and the Arabs are just one more, one more hateful people in a long line of people who hate Jews. And somehow, miraculously, even though the Jewish community was smaller and weaker, within 12 months, the Arab forces were defeated, almost the entire country was conquered, and the state of Israel was established. Now, as a child growing up, this is unbelievably w wonderful to hear, that these were my people. Now, it makes sense because we tell ourselves that we're the descendants of King David who beat Goliath. And we're the descendants of the Maccabees who, be, who defeated the great Greek empire. So this makes perfect sense. We are that kind of people. We're just, you know, better than everybody else. And as a child, this is exactly the kind of story that you like to hear. Now, if you take a closer look, though, if you take a closer look and examine the details, a slightly different version of reality or a slightly different version of what took place emerges. Now, my father was an officer in the, the what was before, it was before the Israeli military. It was a militia. It was a Jewish militia. Um, so for me, this was even more heroic. But when we look at the, two, at the two communities that lived there at the time, they were both expecting and hoping and doing everything they could to be recognized as a state. The Palestinians wanted a Palestinian Arab state. The Jews wanted their own state. And they had institutions of state. So they were very similar in many ways. But there was one thing that the Jewish community invested in that the Palestinians never did. It was a fighting force, a militia. The Jewish militia, or the Zionist militia at the time, numbered close to 40,000 armed, well-trained, and very well-indoctrinated young men. My father was among them. There was no equivalent on the Palestinian side. There was no fighting force on the Palestinian side. Palestinians, by the way, have never had an army or a military force. So who were these Arabs that attacked in 1947? We know that other Arab armies tried to intervene later on in the war, six, seven months later. But at that time, who are the Arabs that attacked then? And what did they attack exactly with? The British who ruled, the, who ruled uh, Palestine then completely disarmed the Palestinians. The reality is that it wasn't the Arabs who attacked. It was the Zionist forces that attacked. It was a Jewish militia that attacked and began a campaign of terrorizing and ethnic cleansing that lasted 12 months. And between the end of 1947 to the end of 1948, an entire civilian population was terrorized. And a campaign of ethnic cleansing took place so that the Jewish community would be able to conquer as much of the land and get rid of as many of its people. And within 12 months, they almost did it. They got rid of almost a million people through forced exile. They managed to conquer almost 80% of the country. They destroyed hundreds of towns and cities and villages, some of them as old as 1,000 years old, including churches and mosques and hospitals and, of course, homes and schools. And this new creation began of the state of Israel. Now it makes sense. Now the story makes sense. You may think it's good, you may think it's bad. You may agree, you may disagree. But now the story, historically at least, makes sense. Now one of the things I did in the book is I went, you know, I talked about my own family and their experience as it relates to this history and the history itself. And there's a story, like you heard earlier, about my mother. This is a picture of my mother when she was young. She's 86 years old now. She was born and raised in Jerusalem. She still lives in Jerusalem. And when she was 22, it was 1948, and she was, like I said, living in Jerusalem. She was already a mother. My father was at the front fighting for the cause, for the Jewish state. And in Jerusalem, and I'm not talking about the old city of Jerusalem, I'm talking about the neighborhoods outside of the old city and what is later became the Israeli side or the Jewish side of Jerusalem. There were neighborhoods, there were Palestinian neighborhoods, large Palestinian neighborhoods, very well-to-do families, very well-to-do communities, and most of those homes actually are still standing in Jerusalem today. You can see them today. They're beautiful homes. Well, when the uh, Israeli forces came in, they forced the Palestinian residents to leave. And these homes were made available to Israeli families. And my mother at the time was living in a small apartment with my older siblings and her mother. That was no fun at all. 
And she was offered one of these homes. And if you've been to Jerusalem and you've walked the streets of those neighborhoods, these are beautiful homes. Some of them are now embassies or just really, you know, rich families took over. The beautiful homes. And my mother's, I don't know, I can't remember when my mother told me the story the first time, but she told it to me many times as I was growing up. And her, the way she told the story when I was a child and the way she talks about it today and the way she was talking about it as I was talking to her, as I was working on the book, is always brings up the exact same emotion. And the way she describes it is, she said, how could I possibly take the home of another family? How can I move into the home of another mother who now has to raise her family in exile? And then she continues and she says, and to see the looters, the Israeli soldiers filling up the trucks with rugs and furniture. And you may have heard there's a documentary about the rare books, thousands of copies of rare manuscripts that were stolen. And she says, I, how were they not ashamed? How are they not ashamed to do this? Now, as I was growing up, this story, there was something about the story that was bothering me. And I couldn't figure it out until I was actually working on the book. Something about the story was just not right. And only, like I said, as I was older and I was working on the book, I realized her story contradicts the national narrative. And that's the problem. The national narrative is, the Arabs attacked, we won, and the Arabs left. Well, if that's the case, why can't we take their home? There's nothing wrong with taking their home. But she was presenting a moral dilemma, a serious moral dilemma. Not only that, but there was something else about her story that was unique, the way she told it. In Israel, even when we accept and even when we acknowledge something that we did as Israelis, something wrong that we did to the Palestinians, there's always a but. There's always an explanation. So for example, there was a, a massacre that everybody knows about called, you know, a village called Dir Yassin. It took place in 1948. And this is a massacre that's been acknowledged and it's even taught in Israeli schools. And the story is, and I remember learning it as a child, the story is that it was a horrible thing, you know, the forces went in, the village surrendered, but there was a terrible massacre. So it was a terrible thing, but Chai Weitzman, who was later on the president of the State of Israel, said that thankfully, thanks to this massacre, there was a massive exile. Thousands and thousands of Arabs escaped as a result of this massacre, which allowed us, the Jews, to become a majority. So even though it was a terrible thing, there was a good outcome. So maybe it's not that bad. So even when we do something wrong, there's an okay side to it. There's something about it which is okay. She wasn't doing that. She just told the story as it is. That's it. We did something wrong. It's the wrong thing to do. End of story. So like I said, that was, as a child, it took me, it was very, it, it was very strange. And, like, and later on, as I was working on the book, I finally, it all came to place. It all fall, fell in place. Now this is the map of Israel between 1948, when it was established, and 1967, for about 20 years. So the entire land, the entire Palestine, or the entire land of Israel, with the exception of the West Bank and Gaza, were part of the state of Israel. And then in the summer, or early summer, and late spring of 1967, the drums of war were beating. The Egyptian president was threatening war. He brought his forces into the Sinai Peninsula, which was uh, supposed to be demilitarized. And he made all these threats. And the Israeli high command decided it was a call for war. Now, my father was a general by then, as were all the other uh, young commanders of 20 years earlier of the, of the 1948 war. Those that remained in the military were now running the show. They were the generals. And they were very young. They were in their early to, late, early to mid 40s. And they were very assertive and aggressive, and they had won every single war they fought. And they demanded that the cabinet give an approval for them to start a preemptive strike against Egypt to punish them for violating the ceasefire agreement. Now, not a single shot has been fired. And the cabinet was hesitant. There was this tug of war between these two forces within Israel. And as is always the case, the military, the more militant, the more forceful of the voices won the day. And the army got the OK to begin a preemptive strike. Now, the story that we hear about the War of 1967 is pretty much along the same lines as what happened in 1947, which is that the Arabs 
were planning to attack the state of Israel, destroy it, and kill all the Jews. This was the history. This was the, I'm sorry, this was the history that was told, and this is the story that was told. And once again, miraculously, because we're smarter and because, again, we're the descendants of the Maccabees and so on and so on, we were able to defeat them, destroy the Arab armies, conquer all that land, and we did it all in six days. It's remarkable. But we did it in 47, 48. We did it against King David. We did it against the Greeks. This is who we are. We're remarkable people, so it makes perfect sense. Problem was, like I said, my father was already a general at that time. And when I was working on my book, the book is titled, by the way, The General's Son. This is the general, my father. Uh, and the second part of the book is The Journey of an Israeli in Palestine. So as I was working on the book, I went into the Israeli army archives to learn about my father's career, but also, or particularly what I wanted to read, were the minutes of the meetings of the generals leading up to the 1967 war. Those were, those were uh, meetings, those were discussions that a lot has been written about. And a lot of historians have taken a look at them and written books about them and, manu and, and, and uh, documentaries and so on. Uh, because it was very contentious and people still was kind of looking for the truth. And I read everything that's been written about it. I wasn't expecting to find anything new, I just wanted to see it. But as soon as I began reading, I saw something that I had never read or seen anywhere before. And that was my father saying, and then the other generals repeating, that actually the Egyptian army, which is really the cause of it all, was not prepared for war. That the Egyptian army had needed at least a year and a half to two years before it's prepared for war, and therefore we need to attack because we have an opportunity. They're saying the fact that the Egyptians brought their army closer to us into Sinai makes it easier for us to destroy them once again, and we need to take that opportunity. Not a single word about a threat. Quite the opposite. And they say again and again, we can attack now, we can attack next month, we can attack whenever we want. We are going to be victorious because the Egyptian army is in shambles. But let's do it now, because better now. Well, what happened to the story about the existential threat? We were told that Israel was, and we're still told this, by the way. Still today, people say this, that Israel was under an existential threat. What happened to the threat? These are the generals. These are the people who are fighting the war, planning the war, in, in charge of intelligence and everything. Well, the campaign against the Egyptians, the, 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 the generals got the OK from the government, so they attacked the Egyptian army, destroyed it. It was a matter of days. They conquered the Sinai Peninsula. I'll go back to the map. They conquered the Sinai Peninsula. And then the generals, on their own, because there was already a momentum, decided they would take the West Bank and attack Syria and get to take the Golan Heights. They did it for two reasons. One, their own ambitions. The, general, the commanders of the, of the central and northern fronts wanted a piece of the action. And these were areas that they had wanted for many, many years. The generals saw taking the West Bank as what they called finishing the job. What job? The job of 1948 of conquering the land of Israel, of conquering Palestine. They were very unhappy that the Israeli government at the time decided not to take the West Bank. So for them, this was finishing the job. And they wanted the Golan Heights, strategically it's placed, there's lots of water, and so on. And they did it. Now, if the Egyptian army wasn't prepared, the, the, the Jordanian and Syrian armies were certainly unprepared. The Egyptian army was really the only army of consequence uh, of all the Arab armies. And in six days, they destroyed three Arab armies. They killed 15,000 Arab soldiers at a loss of 700 Israeli soldiers. Now, every soldier is somebody's son, so you cry for everyone that dies. At the same time, the difference between 700 and 15,000 is striking. They tripled the size of the state of Israel, and they did all of this in six days. Now it makes sense. Now you understand how it was done. A well-prepared, well-trained army, well-motivated army attacks three, three countries that were ill-prepared and conquers land. There's nothing miraculous about this. And in reality, what they managed to do is this. They erased Palestine off the map completely, and Israel took over completely over the entire country. And this was their mission 
and this is what they accomplished. Now, it's interesting because as soon as the, the land was conquered, the West Bank was conquered, they did exactly then what they did 20 years earlier with the, you know, after the War of 1948. Massive campaign of ethnic cleansing, hundreds of thousands were forced into exile, cities and towns and villages were destroyed, and massive building projects began for Israeli Jews only. Even though in the West Bank the majority of the population was still Palestinian. This is exactly what Israel did after 48. They did the repeated exact same thing after 67 because it was the exact same mission to conquer the land, get rid of the people, and build a state, the state of Israel in its place. So today, when people talk about the possibility of Israel allowing the Palestinians to establish a Palestinian state anywhere on that map, it's a complete misunderstanding. It's a complete misreading of what Israel is all about. It's an impossibility. And it goes against this very ideology that created the state of Israel. And, maybe more importantly, it goes against everything Israel has done over the last 65 years. The process of, of conquest, ethnic cleansing, and building for Israeli Jews only has been going on for 65 years, and it's still going on in all parts of the country. The West Bank is completely integrated into Israel, though you can't delineate it anymore. And now, there's another problem. This country, until the State of Israel was established, this country was an Arab country. For 1,500 years, it had an Arab history and culture and monuments, not to mention a language and so forth. So names are being changed, monuments are being destroyed. We already talked about cities and towns being destroyed. And a new history is being written. A history that connects today's Israel with King David, who may or may not have even existed. And there's the de-Arabizing is a very, a very important part of this. We talked earlier about the fact that they're building a, a museum of tolerance now in Jerusalem over an ancient um, cemetery, an ancient Muslim cemetery that goes back 1,200 years. So the cemetery is being destroyed, and a museum of what? Of tolerance is being built on top of it. But that's a small example. There are lots of examples. I'll give you another larger example. If you've been to the old city of Jerusalem, if you've seen the Wailing Wall, when you come out the gate, out the walls, you go down the hill, there's a community called Silwan. It's a community of 50,000 people. Okay, I live in a city that's 30,000 people in, you know, in, here in the US, in California. A community of 50,000 people. And someone said that under the homes of the Silwan, is where the true city of David exists. Now, the past always trumps the present. So the homes of the people of Silwan are being destroyed, and a new park, an archaeological park called the City of David has been established. Tour buses are already there looking at it. You have these massive posters that show these really nice white Jewish kids playing around with ancient, you know, all kinds of archaeological artifacts. The homes of Silwan, the homes in the periphery are being destroyed because their foundations are being destroyed because of the digging. And in the larger periphery, Israeli settlers are taking over more homes. Hundreds have already taken over, which means they bring in a lot of military force because these people have stolen somebody's home, they're afraid for their lives, so there's a military force protecting the settlers. This is ethnic cleansing, destruction, and de-Arabizing all mixed in one in Jerusalem, in broad daylight, everybody can see it every single day, today, under our watch. And nobody says a word. Nobody says a word. Now, my father did something very interesting. He retired from the military a year after the war. And while, even before he retired, he stood up and he said, look, now that we've made all this, these conquests, we need to make peace with the Palestinians. Everybody thought he lost his mind. He said, look, we conquered all the land, we've established ourselves as a strong power, but the Palestinians are still here, we have to resolve the Palestinian problem, or else we're not going to be a democracy, because there will be a large Palestinian population within Israel, or we're going to be an, an occupying, uh, a brutal occupying power. We have to resolve it, and he was talking then, and those were the years where the two-state solution was being 
formulated, really, the idea that a Palestinian state would be established in the West Bank and Gaza alongside Israel. He said, if we do this, we'll have, they'll be the first Arab country to make peace with Israel, and then we can go on from there. But like I said, Israel did exactly the opposite. Massive ethnic cleansing, destruction, and building for Israeli Jews only in the West Bank. And they did it immediately. My father, after he retired, continued to pursue this path of peace. And in the mid-1970s, he and a group of other Israelis were contacted by the Palestine Liberation Organizations, by Yasser Arafat's main people, to begin a dialogue and to try to figure out how to bring about this two-state solution. This is Issam Sartawi, who was one of Yasser Arafat's aides. He was the Palestinian ambassador to Paris for many years. And um, it was interesting, because on the Palestinian side, these were official representatives of the Palestine Liberation Organization. On the Israeli side, there's people like my father who used to hold high position, but now they're really renegades. And whenever they would, would return, they would meet in either uh, Europe or North Africa. It was all in secret. My father would always come back and report to the prime minister. But the Israeli government would have nothing to do with it. Later on in the 80s, the Israeli Knesset, the, par the Israeli parliament, actually passed a law making these specific meetings illegal. They do that. They pass specific laws against specific people and groups. And then suddenly, in 1993, some of you may recall, the Oslo peace process began, and the Israeli prime minister, Rabin, and Arafat were on the White House lawn with President Clinton signing this Oslo Accord. And you wonder, wow, what happened? What happened in 1993 that suddenly, in September, Rabin, or an Israeli prime minister, decided he was going to sign a peace agreement with the Palestinians. By 1993, Israel had made sure that the West Bank was completely integrated into Israel, that the conquest was irreversible, and that there was not a single chance that a Palestinian state could be established in the West Bank. That's when they agreed to begin negotiating with the Palestinians, but it wasn't for peace. It was for surrender. The purpose of the Oslo Peace Accords and all the peace process, if you can call it that, that took place, has been taking place ever since, and the reason it's not working is because it's an attempt to bring the Palestinians to complete surrender, and the Palestinians keep refusing. Then, in the year, my father died in 1995, and his last interview. The, uh, one of the big Israeli papers did an interview with him before he died, and the headline was, Mati Pellet says Rabin doesn't want peace. In 1995, to say Rabin doesn't want peace, those of you who are old enough to remember, it's absurd because he was the Nobel Peace Prize and all these things were happening and he shook the hand of Arafat. But my father and several others, by the way, read the Oslo Accords. And they opposed it because they said this is a surrender and it's not going to work. Then, in the year 2000, President Clinton decided to bring the parties to Camp David. So he brought another Israeli prime minister by then, Ehud Barak, and Yasser Arafat to Camp David, and they were going to close the deal. And the negotiations went on, days after days after days, and another day, and another day. Finally, they came out, and what did Bill Clinton say? He said, well, the Palestinians gave some, but the Israelis gave more. In other words, he was blaming the Palestinians for what? for not making concessions. Let's take a look at the map for a second, OK? By agreeing to the two-state solution, by agreeing to having a state in the West Bank and Gaza, Palestinians gave up 80% of their homeland. They gave up 80% of Palestine for peace. And also, they gave up the right of the refugees to have a return to their homes. So they're not willing to make concessions? They made a major, the major concession. And they recognized a state that destroyed their own country and forced them into exile. And all this for peace. And the claim that was being made as well, Arafat wasn't willing to make concessions. He wasn't willing to surrender. He wasn't willing to do anything less than this, which is what, he was, what they wanted him to do. They wanted him to agree to much, much, much less than this. Little points within the West Bank that would have some limited Palestinian autonomy. And to that, of course, he refused. He was vilified, and then he died in his office with Israeli tanks surrounding him, as some of you may recall, four years later. Now, this has a cost. You know, the theory and the history is all good, but in the end, it comes at a cost. And the cost is always innocent people, children, 
pay the price. And in 1997, on September the 4th, my sister's little girl, Smadar, was killed in a, when two Palestinians blew themselves up in a suicide attack. So how do you wrap your head around something like that? A 13-year-old girl dies just like that, walking down the street one day. I was already living here in the US. I took the first plane home. When I got to Jerusalem, my sister's apartment was already filled with reporters. You know, the front page was already talking about the granddaughter of General Pellet. She was the granddaughter of a famous general, so this was big news, even bigger than normal, than usually things like this are. But not only was he a famous general, he was also famous for, you know, preaching for peace with the Palestinians. And now look what they did to him. When finally, after the funeral, my sister came out to talk to everyone, she was asked, of course, about retaliation and about revenge and about how we would deal with the people who are responsible and all this. And she said something very simple that really helped me wrap my head around it. She said, first of all, in terms of revenge, she said, no real mother would want to see this happen to any other mother. The notion of killing in response to killing. And of course, motherhood being a uniting factor that goes through everything, really, above everything. And then she said, who's responsible? Let's talk about who's responsible. She said, well, these two young men were brought to such a level of hopelessness that they took their own lives and the lives of other innocent civilians, including my 13-year-old daughter. But what brought them to this level of hopelessness? She said, it was we, the Israelis, the occupation, the oppression. When you take away people's homes, when you destroy their homes, when you throw their fathers and older brothers in jail for, for countless years, when you shoot their younger brothers and sisters in their schools, when you deprive them of water, of travel, of any rights whatsoever, of any hope whatsoever, this is what happens. And she said, I hold the Israeli government directly responsible for my daughter's death. So now this bereaved Israeli mother has taken everything and turned it upside down. Because what do we know to be true? We know that the Palestinians are terrorists, the Israelis are victims, the Israelis want peace, the Palestinians want destruction. And now here comes this bereaved Israeli mother and turning everything upside down. And like you heard, she became active. Her husband, Rami, my brother-in-law became active. And this has become something my family is, is, is doing now uh, all the time. What I did was I had to come back to the US. I had a job. I had a business. I had a family. And you, how, do you go back to, how do you go back to work? Let me tell you, when you carry a coffin of a 13-year-old girl to its grave, that it's not something you can go back to work the next day. But you have to. And I was very fortunate that in San Diego, I was able to participate in a Jewish-Palestinian dialogue group. And I was born and raised in Jerusalem, which is supposedly a mixed city. But this was the first time here in the US that I actually met Palestinians. Because Jerusalem, even though it's mixed, it's completely segregated. It's a completely racist city. So I was here in San Diego, I was in San Diego at the time, in a room with Palestinians, just sitting and talking like, you know, normal people for the first time in my life. But not only that, this was the first time I was around Palestinians and we were completely equal. They did not have to go through a checkpoint. They did not need a special permit. The laws that govern me govern them exactly the same. That doesn't exist over there. That does not exist over there at all. There was no curfew they had to meet, nothing. We would talk, we would eat, we'd go home. That was it. And for a lot, of, a lot of Israelis and other Jewish people would come to these meetings and they couldn't take it. They would rush out and say to me, how, do you, how can you sit with these extremists? So what extremists? These are people that are trying to figure this out just like I am. If they were extremists, they wouldn't be here. And very uh, generously and, grac and, 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 and graciously, they took me by the hand from this place from which I came into Palestine, which was really next door to me, but I never saw it. And introduced me to Palestine as a place, to Palestinians as a people, 
and to the Palestinian narrative, which of course was diametrically opposed to my narrative, to what I knew, particularly on the issue of 1948. I remember hearing the first time about massacres. We don't do massacres. We're good people. Forced expulsions. We don't force people out of their homes. We're good guys. I mean, we make mistakes. And very, but they did it. It wasn't a way that it was accusatory. It was just everybody was telling their story. And then, of course, trust comes in and fills in, takes the place of fear. And that's, you know, that's how the process went on. And it was a very painful process. I talk about it today like it was nothing. It was excruciatingly painful. It was like root canal without anesthesia. It was painful physically. Especially for me, where the state of Israel was like my extended family. I had a great uncle who was the president. I had relatives who were cabinet ministers, my father, the general. I mean, the state of Israel was my extended family. So to learn this was very, very painful. And then I began traveling. When I would visit Israel, I'd go to Palestinian communities within Israel. And then I would venture into the West Bank and began visiting Palestinians in the West Bank. And it's interesting, if you've been to the West Bank, if you've traveled between the two sides, you've seen this sign. It's a warning sign, as you can see, even though you can't read it. And it is on the Israeli side of the checkpoints. This particular one is from Kalandia, which is between Jerusalem and Ramallah. And you can see it's a warning sign just by the colors. And what it says is, it tells you that this road leads to Area A, which is under Palestinian control. And then in larger letter, it tells you that it's forbidden for Israelis to enter Area A. It's life-threatening, and it's a felony. And it ends with two exclamation marks, not one. So if you were not impressed by the fact you might lose your life and end up in jail, then the two exclamation marks will probably get your attention. And of course, unless you speak Hebrew, this doesn't count. This is, doesn't, this is not true. So if you have any sense and you see a warning sign, you turn around and you go home. I don't have any sense like that. Thankfully, and I know a lot of Israelis, others that don't, and I went right through to the other side, and I've been doing it for many, many years, and this time, just recently, I went actually through a tunnel, which is even more, you know, more of a felony and more of a life-threatening thing, they would tell me, and every time I cross, I always see the exact same thing. Probably the most common sight in Palestinian cities are children going to and from school, because they have two school shifts, so kids are always on the street, either coming to, going to school or coming home with their little uniforms and backpacks. And you see traffic, and you see stores, and you see people, and I've yet to see the threat. It says here, there's a threat. I've yet to see the threat. I've been doing it for years. I go all the time. I've been to protests. I've been to cities. I've been to villages. I've been to Gaza, for God's sake. I've yet to see the threat. I've yet to see the Palestinian who, who wants to kill me. Who cares that I'm there at all? You know, and I think this is true not for me personally, but this is true for anybody who goes through a checkpoint. It has nothing to do with safety. And the terrorizing of Palestinians at the Israeli airport, Israeli citizens who are Palestinians who want to go overseas, held for hours, interrogated, body searches, cavity searches, for hours, humiliated, in front of everybody like this. It has nothing to do with safety. They want to keep one side afraid, and one side always frustrated. That is the purpose of all of this. It's an entire system of so-called defense and an entire bureaucracy, really, that is designed to keep the two sides always apart. Because as long as they're apart, we can keep going. Now, the way I end my book is a discussion about the future. And this is where the hope comes in. The reality is that Israel created one state, one Jewish state, mind you, but one state over the entire country. The West Bank is completely integrated. Highways and schools and cities and malls and industry and everything else you can imagine are in the West Bank and outside the West Bank, and there is no difference. Israelis travel to and from. They go to Tel Aviv, they go to Ariel. It's the exact same thing. Israeli commanders, Israeli politicians, Israeli prime ministers have always said there is no difference between cities in the West Bank and cities in other parts of the country. They've said it, and they've created that reality. But we still have two nations. We have one state, a Jewish state, so-called Jewish state, but two people. Half the population is not Jewish. 
So the price of having a Jewish state in that country, which is really an Arab country, where half the population is not Jewish, but Palestinian, mostly Muslim, is that you have to have discriminatory laws. You have to have jails filled with thousands and thousands of political prisoners. You have to have a massive military force that always attacks the non-Jews and enforces the laws that discriminate against them because they rise, they resist. And really, you have a democracy only if you're an Israeli Jew. It is a Jewish democracy. It's a democracy that prefers Jews. Of course, it has nothing to do with Judaism. It's not like it's a religious state. But it prefers Jews. So me, as an Israeli, for me, it's a democracy. I can come, I can go, I can say what I like. I'm a citizen. Now, you have citizens who are, who are Palestinians, about a million and a half of them. There are specific laws in the law books that discriminate against them. And it's funny because one of the things, not funny, but interesting, that one of the claims being made by the pro-Israel groups is, see, Israel is such a wonderful democracy, even Arabs are citizens and they can vote. And they do so well that they don't even want to leave. Never mind, they were there before the Jews came. The reality is that the Palestinian communities within Israel are so neglected. Oftentimes, the situation in some of these communities is worse than it is in Gaza, and Gaza is under siege. You'll be hard pressed to find a single dollar invested or a single permit ever given to Palestinians within Israel to build anything a house, a school, anything, a road. At the same time, Entire cities and communities and malls and highways are being built for Israelis only. While well, these communities are growing in number but shrinking in size. And then you have the Palestinians who are living in the West Bank and Gaza, which of course is now integrated geographically, but they have no laws that protect them at all. They have no rights at all. They're at the mercy of the Israeli military, which I would argue today is nothing but a glamorized terrorist organization. They have uniforms and commanders, of course, yes, and so everybody treats them with respect like they're an army. They're not an army, they're a terrorist organization because they are dedicated to terrorizing an entire nation. They drop bombs on children knowing they're going to kill children as a matter of policy. They deny people water as a matter of policy. They terrorize people as a matter of policy. They meet nonviolent peace protests with massive amounts of violence as a matter of policy. So why am I optimistic? You have about six and a half million Israelis and about six million Palestinians now. You have two societies that are very similar. Most Israelis are actually descendants of Arabs because the vast majority of Jews that immigrated to Israel came from Arab countries. So these are Jews from Iraq and Jews from Syria and Jews, Jews from Lebanon and Jews from North Africa. And they make up the majority of Israelis. So if they don't speak Hebrew, Arabic, their parents speak Arabic. Their grandparents speak Arabic for sure. They listen to Arabic music. They are familiar with Arabic culture. The vast majority of Israelis are actually Arabs. They're Jewish, but they're Arabs. Levels of education, literacy rates are the same, very high. Some of the highest literacy rates in the world, both among Palestinians and Israelis. 92, 90, even in Gaza. Even Gaza has a 92% literacy rate. I don't know if the US has that kind of a literacy rate. And so there's a lot of potential for these two societies to work together and live together and create something unique. Now, both societies have, a democratic, have democratic traditions. There are already areas where the two societies merge. I'll give you an example, hospitals, OK? My mother just had surgery. Like I said, she's 86. The anesthesiologist was a Palestinian. And the surgeon was a Palestinian. And I have a cousin who's a, who's a uh, surgeon at Hadassah. And he says some of the best, not some of, the best, the most skilled surgeons in Israel are Palestinians trained in Amman, Jordan. But the problem is that that same surgeon who treated my mother so well, when he goes to the airport, he's treated like a criminal. He's held for hours. He's investigated and strip searched and God knows what. And then he's led by the hand to his seat in the plane like a criminal. That cannot go on. 
Palestinians even work in, Pal in, in Israeli cities in the West Bank, where they can't even live, where they can't even shop. So there are areas where the two societies are already merging because it's inevitable. Now, how do we get from here to there is exactly the point. How we get from here to there is by focusing. If we care for peace, if we care for democracy, if we care for equal rights, if we want justice, the focus has to be on creating a real democracy. Instead of a Jewish state, a state of all of its citizens, a state of all the people who live in that country, all 11 or 12 million people. That has to be the goal. That has to be the stated goal of anybody who cares for the region, who cares for peace and justice. I know churches are dealing with this, trade unions are dealing with this, student groups are dealing with this, uh, you know, all kinds of civil organizations are dealing with this. This has to be the name of the game, and I would, I would suggest, that I would argue that it is not only realistic and possible, but it's inevitable. If the wall came down tomorrow, you would have, you could have, you could have a functioning democracy the next day. Because people are ready to go to work. And the future could be very bright. I mean, if you've been there, you know it's a beautiful country. It's got a lot of potential. The people have potential. The missing ingredient is equal rights. The missing ingredient is democracy. And once we've accomplished that, we're home. Thank you all very much.